Oh, yeah. Okay. They're all coming in now. <laughs> so <laughs> had a little bit of a heart attack there. No worries. Okay. Well, welcome. Um, my name is Sharon Rutherford, and we're happy to be able to host today's webinar, which is Workers' Compensation and COVID-19 Claims. Uh, this is in partnership with SureFact and Rankin Ellison Lawyers. Um, look, we are very pleased to present this to you and hope that you are able to, I guess, get some key findings and outcomes and guidance as we sort of navigate this very challenging uh, times um, and hopefully uh, some key insights that you can consider as we move through these slides. Um, sorry, let me navigate. So just as a bit of an um, overview, uh, it'll sort of key introductions of our panelists and um, uh, partner providers. Uh, an overview, I guess, of what led to this webinar starting and I guess the intent behind it. We'll then move into a bit of a sure fact findings and a bit of a deep dive. Uh, so we'll hand over the prezzo to uh, the co-hosts at SureFact, a bit of a summary, followed by some frequently asked questions and any final closings. Uh, we'll try to keep the webinar to about 45 minutes um, to allow us sort of some Q&A, but also give us a bit of a buffer. Our intent today is really to have a conversation around this subject. So um, we'll definitely be engaging our panelists as far as uh, the slides are concerned. Um, and there is an option for Q&A, so please do send your messages through or questions through. It'll be monitored and I guess subject to the timing and, and the complexity of the question. We may be able to answer it straight away or have to uh, withhold it at the end. If we're not able to get to all the Q&As, um, we can actually summarize uh, our answers and we can send it out to the greater group post the webinar itself. Um, no worries. So just about Honan. So Honan has been operating uh, since uh, 1965 um, and is one of the largest privately owned um, insurance brokers within Australia. Um, we provide a holistic sort of, uh, we provide a holistic service solution across general insurance and workplace risk practices. Um, you know, we have both at a local level and a global um, reach with regards to our client base. We're, we're part of the worldwide broker network, which means that we're able to bring global insurance solutions uh, or get access to global markets for insurance solutions, should I say. Um, and yeah, we're located here in Australia and have offices in New Zealand, Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, as I've said, my name is Sharon Rutherford, um, Head of Workplace Risk. I've been with Honan for four years now, but have over 16 years experience. Um, and I'll hand over to Jules, who'll be able to introduce himself and a little bit more about our division within Honan. Thank you, Sharon. Hello, everyone. No Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Jules Palino is my name, Senior Client Manager. I've just looked through the attendee lists and good to see a lot of our clients have, have phoned in. A lot of you will know me. Um, my my remit is is essentially doing, working with our clients very closely um, and ensuring a collaborative approach to their to their to their high end workplace risk needs are provided. Um, but m moving into our team and and what we what we do, our services, uh, we're, we're, we're a national workplace risk provider, specialist advisory and consulting services. Uh, a lot of our time and engagement is focusing on insurer and agent management around the liability space and ongoing management of, of your higher risk claims. We provide a lot of, of service and, and resources within the policy and premium management space, claims cost reporting, uh, premium data reporting. Above all else, we provide value via partnership engagements like you have today with the panel. Um, early intervention and, and intimate knowledge of your business supports the best possible outcome when it comes to complex claims. And I hope you get a lot out of, out of what we're going to talk through today. Thanks. No worries. And now we're presenting partners. So I'll give a bit of a, an overview of the, the companies themselves, and then I can throw to the individuals if they, if they would like to add any particular points uh, about their services. So SureFact Australia, um, present, co-presenting today's panelists is Matthew Sito and Anthony Dioka, um, uh, CEO. Um, Anthony is the CEO, and then Matthew is the new uh, recently appointed GM as well within the business. Uh, SureFact Australia has established itself as one of the, uh, the nation's most efficient and successful investigation companies offering an extensive, extensive range of services. Um, leading their leading uh, investigation organization in Australia and New Zealand and provide a number of services to many different organizations and individuals across the country. In particular, they act as a scheme preferred panel provider, um, providing fact 
action and surveillance investigations utilized by insurers when considering liability determination. Uh, combined, they provide you know, over 40 years experience in the workers' compensation um, space, um, broadly speaking. Um, however, I'll throw to yourselves, and if you would uh, like to add any other points there that I missed or, or didn't uh, highlight enough, by all means, um, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Um, as you did say, we are a nationwide investigations firm. We, we do work with a lot of insurers across the country, uh, obviously being on the IK panel here in New South Wales and also in the WorkSafe panel in Victoria. Um, Anthony and I have recently started working together um, to further take those services um, to the market and improve along those as well. So a long-standing organization with uh, a long time to come. No worries. Um, so again, in addition to the panel, our legal expert matter, uh, Jim Retos, uh, he is partner at Rankin Ellison. Um, and Rankin Ellison advises major clients in the insurance and service industries in the corporate arena uh, across Australia. Uh, they are preferred legal advisor for a number of major government and non-government organizations in the areas of statutory legislation, employer-employee relations, and other litigation. A large part of their work consists in acting, consists in acting for government agencies and departments of complex statutory litigation. Uh, Rankin Ellison in New South Wales are actually on the eye care preferred panel provider. So um, I guess one of the options that can be um, chosen when you are considering legal advice. Now, as far as I guess our, our, our provider partners, I really want to highlight, you know, when we think about workers' compensation, often is, you know, as an employer or as an, you know, a business, you have a claim and then you deal with the insurer, you lodge it to the insurer and then the insurer uh, manages the claim. You might have your broker intermediary in that process but I guess one of the value adds that you know we really have um, is our provider relationships because they really actually ground out that ecosystem because at the end of the day the insurers rely on these providers to actually help build out a, a, a determination when it comes to liability or claims management process and we'll refer to these providers um, in the fact gathering process um, throughout the life cycle of the claim whether it's the initial liability ongoing liability or just sort of up services as regard as a result of um, whatever needs arise um, so really the importance of our our provider network. Uh, I really cannot sort of um, highlight enough because at the end of the day, they're actually doing the groundwork for you as a business. So, and really are the ones who are, are, are bringing to the table a lot of these key insights um, because they're actually dealing with the claims and in the, in the nuances of these claims um, in a very detailed way. So uh, if at the end of the day, if you, if you don't align yourself with a provider, um, we hope that these providers can give you the insights of what they do and obviously the, the power of, of their support in this process. Um, now, the presentation overview um, itself really is um, kind of came about as a result of a conversation I was having with SureFact. They actually came to us and presented a um, similar presentation as far as their key findings, and it was really a no-brainer as far as bringing this to the greater, to our clients, as well as just um, any audience that's willing to, lish, to listen. You know, the, the reality of COVID-19 is impacted everyone in different ways, particularly businesses and individuals, um, and is a constantly changing landscape. Um, there has been impact as around certain legislation changes, and I'll get Jim to comment on this um, a little bit because this is covered later in the slides, but he can preface that, um, there, which has also, I guess, added a further layer of con um, consideration around the liability determination. So then providing, so again, by us um, working with our providers, you know, this has allowed us to bring some really key industry insights to you. And really, uh, I guess at the end of the day, the outcomes you want to be able to achieve is what this journey looks like. And at the end of the day, when it comes to claims management, you know, we, we don't, we, it's not a reactional outcome. When it when we consider a, you know an injury that occurs, you know the reality is we want to provide a safe workplace, but you know injuries occur. So when we want to support recovery at work, there is really a journey that needs to be considered, and it actually starts really at that early intervention, even sometimes before we, we an injury arises. Um, and if an injury does arise, how we actually then sort of set out the steps to have an effective outcome to ensure that not only is that person recovering, but we're mitigating these types of injuries happening again. So hopefully uh, this overview will give you those tips and tricks and the insights of how you can make an informed decision um, uh, 
should you be dealing with these circumstances or if you've not dealt with it, if it happened, if it arises down the track, you know how to respond accordingly. Um, so we'd be remiss not to provide some basic claims data. Um, I'm not sure if, if a lot of you uh, have insight to this information, um, but this uh, provides sort of two, two, um, two components of information. The slide to the left, which is Safe Work Australia, is a snapshot of claims that uh, came through during the calendar period of 2020. Um, as we know, Safe Work Australia uh, have a report lag in their data and, and analytics, et cetera. So this information, I guess, is, is a bit dated. However, the information on the right actually shows um, more recent sort of stats around claims uh, across the different states and territories. Ultimately, um, this data is, is captured as at October, and, and we can understand and we know that this is going to be fluid and it's, it's obviously increased, et cetera. But when you kind of consider the amount of cases and impact COVID has had um, to us as all, to the community as a whole, the actual impact to workers' compensation is probably not as high as what we thought. Um, we would expect that across the states who haven't had many uh, exposures from a workers' um, from a from a COVID nineteen um, impact, you know, probably have lesser amount of claims, and, and therefore, Vic in New South Wales, uh, it's it's um, it's not a surprise that they're that, they're, that they are at the top of that list. New Sharon, South I, Wales, might, I might just intervene there and, and just oh, uh, yes, yeah. obviously talk about. The the fact that you know, I think it's no surprise that New South Wales and Victoria would, would have would have higher amounts, but you know there are claims acceptance occurring in SA, Queensland, and, and WA and Tas. You will see within the data snapshot there that not all claims actually get accepted. 127 were rejected that were lodged, and you know there's there's baseline around that. I think that'll be the, the thought that, that everyone comes across when they think about COVID in the workplace. And we will talk about it later on in the presentation. But yeah. in summary, there needs to be a real and substantial connection between contracting the virus and the workplace. Hence why not all these claims do get accepted. Um, that if, 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 if there's no real connection between the two, the insurer won't, won't accept liability. So we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later on in, yeah. the, in the presentation. And that's actually a good segue, and I might actually get Jim, I mentioned previously, I'd get you to comment on New South Wales and the presumptive relationship as well. I know that... Um, there's been some activity in that space, and uh, yeah, what's your thoughts and comments as we sort of move into the the slides? Is that the the presumed section? Yes, in the yeah, section 19B. Yeah, well, the New South Wales government brought that in in May 2020, and that was very early on in the piece when we didn't know much about COVID. Nobody knew much about COVID, yeah. but they thought it was going to be such an important issue that they bring in this legislation that said if you're if you're working in certain types of prescribed employment it's going to be deemed or presumed that you contracted covid in the course of your employment yeah and we'll look at those sectors of of the workforce later on um, but last november the New South Wales government said, oh, it's, it's time to get rid of this now. We've got a high vaccination rate. There's no need for it, blah, blah, blah. And the, and the Greens and the AMA and um, Health Union and the police jumped up and down and said, are you going to punish frontline workers by withdrawing this presumptive legislation? And when you look at, so it's on hold at the moment, by the way, it's it's going to be the subject of a Senate review or may have already been and, and further things are going to happen with respect to that in February, which is this month. Um, so I think the compromise is going to be that it's going to be kept for frontline workers, health, police, firefighters, those sorts of people um, and aged care workers. But I think it'll be relaxed for things like the retail sector, which is, Mr. Perrottet is concerned that jobs aren't being created and that's why he wants to get rid of it. But I think the compromise will be to keep it for frontline workers. Thanks, Jim. Now, just um, finally, before I hand over to Sherfat, um, like while a lot of this content may be more specific to New South Wales, the reality is, is a lot of these principles and takeaways, um, I guess, can be considered across um, you know, in the other states and territories, the reality is the way uh, liability is determined 
all have the same similar theme arising of or uh, arising out of or in the course of employment. Um, so the practicalities can be applied regardless of which state that you sit in. And, and obviously, um, the reality is New South Wales and VIX are, are really leading the way. Um, so, so for those of you on the West Coast, you can probably start to see these similar trends uh, probably start to arise or, or present themselves as they, um, the other states start to, I guess, catch up. Hopefully they don't, but the reality is. Sharon, I can add that Western Australia also introduced the presumptive, yeah. The presumptive sec but it limited it to those frontline workers, whereas New South Wales tried to cover too much. Yeah, yep. correct. Mm. Thanks, Jim. Okay, finally, over to your sure fact. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Sharon. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for dialing in. Um, for what we've seen, you know, COVID-19 has been with us for around three years now. We've seen infection, uh, infection rates fluctuate up and down. Um, I think we've seen it very recently, especially in New South Wales and Victoria. There's some peaks up there around the 20,000 infections uh, per day, and now that's dropping back down into the lower uh, thousands, not so much in the, the tens of thousands. Um, some other things that we have seen, obviously, is vaccinations being a precursor to accessing a lot of uh, events, services uh, within the community. Um, and with that, there's been some partially mandated um, vaccination requirements in the workplace. Uh, that's probably where we've seen the predominant uh, amount of claims and things that we've seen to investigate is in that uh, vaccination becoming mandated, but we will get into that a little bit later on. Um, the way that we are investigating these claims is evolving. Um, there's different aspects that we need to take into consideration and obviously with changes in legislation as well, we need to look at the different ways that our investigators tackle those investigations. Um, and like we said, and, and as Jim pointed out before, the legislation that governs the claims in the space is evolving. There's discussions, there's discussions in different states and it's obviously um, given that it's such a new virus and a new way of living for us what that's going to look like we're not really sure so we just need to roll with it and involve with it as it comes along um, some of the major themes that we've seen in the investigations that we've done so far is there's a lot of information out there in regards to COVID-19 and uh, not just about the virus itself but also the way that it's changing in the workplace. Um, so one of the main causes of injury that I have seen when we've gone through these investigations is that employees are feeling this sense of being overwhelmed with the amount of information that's provided. Um, that could be in the form of multiple emails. Um, I've read through some reports where there's been 19 updates on COVID safe legislation in the space of six weeks. Um, so one of some of the claims that we've seen is the employees are saying it's just way too much, too much information being provided and they're just overwhelmed with it all. Um, they understand that things are changing all the time, um, but it was just that sense of just everything being overwhelming coupled with work and their home life. The next one that we've seen is that sense of feeling pressure into having a vaccination, even if they're not adverse to receiving it. So, I have gone through some investigations where the claimant has said, I'm not adverse to getting the vaccination. I just want to get some more information on it. But however, I've been given all these deadlines to get the vaccination. And if I haven't got it, then it might have affected my employment. Um, I guess that sort of leads on to the next one where there's a sense of stress and anxiety around new policies being created. Um, we all know that it's a new virus, uh, even within Shorefact ourselves, we've had new policies and procedures drawn in regards to COVID-19 vaccinations, uh, site visits, etc. cetera. Um, the other one that we also see, and, and Jim, you've probably seen quite a few of these ones as well, is uh, people stating that there's been bullying and harassment claims around vaccinations. What they're saying is management or, or through the organisation are pushing them towards vaccinations, even if they don't want to, obviously with those uh, people with the pro-choice uh, matters around that. Um, I know that I've personally seen um, bullying and harassment mentioned, at least 
in two of every five of the ones that we've investigated. Um, Jim, is that something that you've sort of seen in the, in the cases that you've worked with so far as well? Yeah, look, that's um, bullying and harassment. Those two words are, are, are easily flung around. And I mean, the, the main thing you're looking at from an employer's point of view is, are all the steps and measures that you've taken reasonable and following a, a, a risk assessment and consultation with your employees? Uh, it's just a, ma a matter of how you deliver the message. I think all employers would like all their employees to get vaccinated. And the way we played it internally here at Rankin Ellison is we invited people to do it and everyone came on board and that's 60 employees. We didn't have a single one. What I have seen in claims referred to me is uh, in the aged care sector uh, where it's clear under the public health order that aged care sector employees have to be vaccinated. And even though, and if they can't bring themselves within any exemption, then they have to be vaccinated before they can set foot back at work. The same goes for teachers. Um, um, so uh, I've, I've done advices saying, um, you've asked this person, this employee to be vaccinated, has refused in contravention of the public health order, um, and therefore you've instigated disciplinary action. In other words, you've stood them down. And that brings it within, in New South Wales, we call it Section 11A. It's a section that employers get very excited about, um, and, but they're still, it, it's a defence to a claim for psychological injury that that injury has resulted from action, reasonable action taken or proposed to be taken by an employer with respect to discipline, performance appraisal, transfer, promotion, demotion, dismissal, retrenchment, et cetera. So um, yeah, they try and describe, workers try and describe it as bullying and harassment. Um, again, it's always has what the employer done, is that reasonable? Yes, correct. And I would add, I would add as well, most states and territory, well, all of them have um, a similar legislation or piece of legislation where where there is reasonable management action, you know, liability can be declined as well. So certainly it's not just specific to New South Wales. I would probably add as well that, yes, certainly these trends are, are what we are seeing across some of our clients, as well as um, when we do speak to our insurer partners and other provider partners as well. Um, it, it's a very common theme and something, I guess, sort of a key takeaway for the audience today is that, you know, if you're sort of haven't necessarily seen these outcomes, you know, definitely this is what we can expect um, when claims start to arrive, uh, arise as well. Um, so, yeah, Matthew. Yes. Uh, so some of the known uh, outcomes of the claims that we've seen so far, um, those that have been accepted um, is people that have contracted COVID during the course of their employment. Uh, we do often do investigations in respect to that. I, we actually had one that uh, come through the other day where we needed to get the timeline and events to ensure that COVID was contracted in, in the course of employment um, and obviously tracing the steps from uh, pre-contraction of the, the, the virus to uh, the time that they actually put in their workers' compensation claim. Um, sort of mixed ones, and this is probably goes back to those claims that have uh, been linked to bullying and harassment and pressure to vaccinate. Um, I think that's around those public health order management uh, ones where there could be some sort of grey area. Um, you've seen some mixed results in that space. Um, declined, definitely those with the public order, health order mandate, not just in New South Wales, but there's a big uh, push through in Victoria as well. Uh, and I think there's actually more people that are included in that Victorian space. Um, and the last one is where we've been able to link that people have lodged physical injuries that aren't as severe or non-existent, um, but they've lodged a physical injury claim. However, it's because of COVID-19 mandates where they may have been stood down without pay. So they've said that they've, um, one of the ones that I vividly remember was someone had uh, said they've injured their back and it's over the course of their employment that their back has become worse and worse and now they can't work anymore. So therefore they, they needed to lodge a claim for compensation for payments. 
Um, what it was found was the claimant themselves was um, part of the anti-vaccine movement and didn't want to get vaccinated. And there was quite a bit of evidence out there that suggested that. And, and we were actually find the causal link that um, yeah. it was because of the COVID-19 um, mandated vaccinations for the workplace. Um, again, this might be something that um, Jim and probably yourselves, Sharon and Jules, might be able to shed some light on and the ones that you've seen from your clients um, or, or dealt with, Jim, in the matters that have been referred to you. Yeah, look, that's an interesting spin-off in another sense, and that is with everyone, with a lot of people working from home, um, you'd be amazed what's, what some people think um, happens to them at home if they have a little accident or whatever, they think they can make a workers' compensation claim. Um, but, um, yeah, I had, I had a client call me the other day and say, oh, someone, um, during their lunch break, they went out to pull their clothes down off the line and hurt their shoulder. Is that compensable? And I said, I don't think so. Um, whereas someone who trips over their computer cord as they get up from their desk, that might be. Mm. So there's all sorts of different possibilities about the working from home as a result of COVID rather than having, you know, suffered COVID itself or whatever. And we did a lot of work around that, Jim, at the start of the working working from home arrangements with another one of our, of our service providers, Rehab Life, mm. um, home ergonomic assessments, robust policy and procedures, you know, additional supervision from management, all, all aids to, 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 to prevent those situations from occurring at home. Well, Jim, what's just, in, what's, what, sorry, Jules, what's important mm. there is that you get the sure facts to get out there early before the worker gets a chance to think about it and change their story or maybe even get legal advice to get the statement as quickly as possible. To exactly get right. Exactly right. Jim, I've just got a question on the decline claims. Now, obviously things move quite fast and, and change, change just as quick as well. Have you seen many of these declined claims be tried and tested in court? And do you think there's any exposure there for case law to, to, to enable a lot of these decline claims to be overturned in time? Um, there's always quite a bit of a lag between disputing, issuing a mm. notice on the claim and it ending up and being determined in the, in the relevant state or territory tribunal, in our case, the New South Wales Personal Injury Commission. So I have not seen any cases specifically on a decline, someone who, for example, refuses to get vaccinated, even though a public health order applies to them. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Jim, I might have, an, uh, have another question as well. As far as your reviews of, I guess, a claim where um, there is a potential decline, um, but we haven't been able to execute it, is there particular reasons around um, the why not, as in the failure of the employer not having done their policies or procedures, or can you provide an example where, you know, subject to a process having been followed, we could have executed a claim, but we're not able to because the gap was there as far as the evidence that was put forward from the employer side of the... Yeah, look, in all words, all, all legal proceedings and disputed cases boil down to what evidence has one side got and what evidence has the other side got. From an employer's point of view in dealing with COVID, if, if there's a nice safety risk assessment document that the employer has authored in consultation with its employees that clearly sets out all of the precautions to reduce the risk of COVID, COVID transmission uh, in the workplace, etc. That's the starting point. Uh, getting back, sorry, Jules. Getting back to your question before, I did find a few cases that applied to the flu vaccine, where the some workers were refusing to have that, even though they were in aged care or whatever, um, and the the courts have upheld the employer's right to have the worker have that flu vaccine unless they qualify for an exemption because of some pre-existing condition that doesn't that that makes it risky for them to have it. Interesting, interesting. And I and, and I would assume that that would fall some type of basis for an argument to eventuate with with the COVID vaccine. 
Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, we, we've given an advice to another client late last year where the care, a caretaker refused to have the vaccine and he came up with something from his GP. Now, we all know GPs, if your family GP will do whatever he can to assist you. Um, and what I don't know the specifics of how this was documented, but it was not accepted uh, what the doctor was um, trying to do. He didn't succeed and nor did the caretaker succeed in proving that it was a risk for him to take the vaccination. Right. Thanks, Jim. Um, again, changes to legislation. I, I think we've already gone through this a mm. bit with the presumptive uh, legislation. Uh, I think the only question that we'd have on this is do, I guess, in the question that we would have, is there going to be a issue for those that are suffering from long COVID? I guess it would, from my perspective, would be um, a question that would probably be answered a little bit later on. But mm. I guess I would wonder what, Sharon, what maybe your thoughts are on, on that and if um, that they are changing the legislation from presumptive and there is someone that's suffering from long COVID, mm. um, do you think any of your clients would probably fall into that and how that would impact them? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and yeah, look, it is sort of a, a new emerging word that is starting to present itself. Um, and, and I guess the reality is that it is, whilst a, uh, an emerging risk, it's still information that we're all trying to figure out and, and make, uh, I guess, sort of a relatively informed decision. You know, I think if we always go back to, you know, the the basis of the legislation, it comes down to always being as a result of whether it occurred as far as being in the course of employment, you know, so I think if we're going to have a direct correlation to long COVID impacts, you know, I would probably say the strongest thing would be where there has been a mandated vaccine being um, made by an employer and then the long COVID actually becomes a reality where there might be a stronger connection between the individual and the suffering of the long COVID and, and obviously the work relatedness of, of that. Um, you know, I think one of the bigger issues that long COVID is going to have and present for employ for employers and I think individuals is the impact on more of an industrial relations um, side of things because, you know, the reality is we don't know, uh, we don't know enough and, I might be putting my foot in it, but I guess we don't know enough about the side effects of the vaccine itself when the data is not necessarily clear yet to understand um, and, and co whether it's the vaccine or whether it's even the COVID impacts. It's, it's just not available yet to really know how this is going to play out. Um, you know, the reality is we always got to consider what our risk exposure is. Um, and with the information we have, how do we start to build out a framework to make informed decisions to mitigate that risk is really where it comes down to. Jim? Um, interestingly, I was doing a bit of research on long COVID um, and uh, discovered that the WHO describes it as um, anything uh, from two months plus. Yeah. Um, and I think the max I've seen is three years. Um, and some percentage, because these are all guesstimates, because... The government hasn't as yet gotten around to following up people who have tested positive for COVID as to what symptoms they have experienced and for how long after. Mm. Okay, so when that information is, when the government finally gets around to um, getting that information together, we'll have a better idea of long COVID, what that actually means in terms of uh, months uh, and years or whatever. Um, but um, I saw somewhere uh, someone had a guesstimate at 5% of total infections result in some sort of long COVID or another, but not what I would have thought before in terms of only two months. Um, you know, so that mm. 5 is probably a high figure. Um, and, and, you know, if I'm still if I've still got a bit of a cough, having tested positive myself on January 13, and it's now Feb 15, uh, then um, I might start falling into that category soon um, mm. myself. But you know, I don't feel anything, whatever. Um, yeah. Um, now, it might be. Yeah, sorry. 
I oh, know I was just going to say um, if anyone's interested in um, the types of prescribed employment, what sectors um, were covered by the presumption provision that came in in May 2020, which the government, the New South Wales government now wants to get rid of, and which I say is probably going to be compromised to take out a lot of the, the sort of the private sector stuff, if you like, like retail, which is where their concern is. Um, the government has said that it thinks that the retail sector is going to cop a premium increase of up to half a billion dollars across the board, which seems like a lot to me, I've got to say, but mm. I don't know, um, maybe. Um, and the, the government wants to remove the presumption on the retail sector uh, because it doesn't want employers not to be creating jobs. Uh, um, so that's its, its major reason. But it really did include a lot of industries uh, or sectors of the economy in its original uh, mm -hmm. legislation, which it probably didn't need to. Mm -hmm. And now they're trying to, to back off a bit. And the Greens and the Labor in New South Wales are not allowing them to do that so easily. But like I said, I think they'll keep it for the frontline workers and let the so rest... Jim, go. Jim, based on that, do you think they'll keep it um, very similar to what they do with the front line, especially with the New South Wales Police Force. And obviously when there was changes to legislation before, that they will have their own, I guess, set of legislation that wouldn't have changed. I think, from... I, I think they'll limit it like they did in WA from the beginning. Yeah. The essential workers. Yeah, that, that would make you sense. Don't want, you don't want to punish them because they're, they're the ones that are helping deal with COVID-19. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you often see that the states will tend to follow each other subject to who's leading the way in that space as well. So it, it's a good benchmark to have in that regard. Um, okay, so I guess this is where we get into the nitty gritty in it, and and really from an audience point of view, what we need to consider. And I um yeah, uh, so if if at if this point you haven't taken much away, then I, I think this might be a certain uh, certainly a slide for you to consider. Yeah, definitely. And um, obviously, this is what our investigators are looking for um, when we're doing an investigation into COVID-related claims. And a lot of this has been uh, through instructions as well as through um, law firms such as Jim's. But, you know, the first thing that we're doing is obviously trying to find the facts. Um, we're, we're going to get the comprehensive information surrounding all aspects of the claim. Um, and that includes witness statements and any documented information. So as we said before, um, there may have been communications provided to an organisation. Any copies of those communications, even if you think it's fairly small or irrelevant, um, it, it probably is more relevant that you believe uh, than you believe uh, when investigating these matters. Uh, when we give this information on to the insurers or onto Jim um, and the legal panels, um, they're able to piece together a timeline, and obviously we do that as well as part of our reports, is piece together a timeline of information that's been provided and how much information uh, was given to a claimant in that space. Um, obviously, once we've, uh, we've gone through that and we're talking to our witnesses, talking to the claimant, we're probing along the way as well, um, finding and connecting items of information that it might have been not might have been visible at the claimant uh, submission phase. So when they've submitted their claim, you know, they, they might've just given a very broad uh, reason as to why they've given uh, or why they're having the workers' compensation claim. And obviously we will probe and ask the appropriate questions. And then based off the answers that we receive, we ask a few more and just get a bit more information from there. Um, again, documentation. And I think, um, Jim, you, you touched on this before, but things like not just employment contracts, pay slips, but you know, the policies, procedures, any other documentation that is actually relevant to the claim around, and especially with COVID, all the new claims, um, all the new policies that are written, the different versions along the way as well. I think that's uh, that will play a very important part when trying to piece together a workers' compensation claim. And as investigators, we're going to ask for that information and say, all right, so you've got this policy. It says you're up to version three. How many versions were before and what did it look like? And has there been conflicting information in between as well? Mm. Um, and then obviously the witnesses. Um, 
there's a lot of people that hear things in, especially in office situations, and they may have overheard or seen um, uh, the incident take place. So we'd want to talk to them and get uh, what they had seen uh, as part of this investigation. Um, I think those uh, those accounts often uh, assist as well in providing that information back to your employees um, and to your clients as well, Sharon, obviously helps, especially getting those signed statements back. Um, sometimes we'll take a, uh, a statement, but we've only got the draft version, but getting that signed statement is what Jim would be able to use if it was to proceed, uh, to, proceed to a tribunal. Mm-hmm. Um, Jim, was there anything else that you think would assist um, when we're doing these investigations, obviously we're looking to gather as much information as possible, but is there anything that you've sort of seen along the way that would assist even further? Yeah, look, the, the more detailed, the better. I was just reading, I don't know if everyone's seen that, the, that guy that travelled to New York, the dental technology guy, and, and actually died within a week of contracting it. And um, his, his um, widow was successful in, in obtaining... Um, death benefits. Um, But the amount of detail, I'll just read you a little bit of the arbitrators, or they're called the members now, Um, the detail that you need to go into chronologically because that's how you tie in uh, the medical evidence in terms of the incubation period. Uh, How long from when you first experience symptoms uh, do you test positive? There's a whole science behind that, obviously. So sure fact would obtain as much factual detail as possible, which then gets provided to the medical experts. We get the expert medical opinion, then we tie the two together and advise the client of the likely outcome. But I'll give you an example. In this, in this, in the guy that went to New York, and he didn't time it well because there were people dying and being um, piled up in alleyways. There was there, It was so raging in New York when he went, but he got a special exemption to go, and he was an anti-masker. Didn't like to wear the mask. Um, so uh, paid the ultimate price for that, the poor bugger. But the arbitrator said on 15 July 2020, he left Sydney at 10.30 a.m., Travelled to New York via San Francisco at approximately 8.35, arriving in New York about 4 p.m. And that sort of record continues throughout the next uh, seven days um, in that amount of detail. So that's what we that gives you an example of what we need to be able to give the doctors so that they can give us their expert medical opinion as to when and more likely where was the COVID-19 contracted? It's mm, very good detail inside, Jim. Mm. Um, I think yeah. that just really reiterates the, the short answer to the commonly asked liability question. There needs to be a real and substantial connection between A and B, you know, A being A being the virus, B being employment. And if that establishes and if that connection isn't established, the claim will ultimately be declined. So um, it, yeah, it's it's important. I think Sharon, you earlier referenced Western Australia as a benchmark. Look, they don't have the community cases as we do over here now in the Eastern States. So it'd probably be quite, quite quite an easier task to make that connection. While there's so much community trans, transmission, it, it would be incredibly challenging to do that right. over here in the East right now. So um, yeah, good information there. Yeah, definitely. And I think that touches on this slide. We, we've mm. gone through all those sort of things that have assisted in those claims. And that very last point is what Jim was talking about. The In a lot of offices, the walls are fairly thin. So when, when we're having those discussions with people, it could be a witness would be someone that's in the office right next door or, or part of the same cubicle block. And, you know, it would be information that they may deem irrelevant it could be relevant, as as Jim said. Um, the other thing is, if there's any uh, information around social media posts, etc., where um, we can piece together the timeline, uh, we have used those as part of our investigations and, and doing our desktop compliance reports to obtain that information to see if there's um, a link 
especially if that presumptive uh, legislation is changed. Um, as Jim said, if, if someone's gone to a wedding with 40 people that have tested positive, but they're dead certain that they've contracted the virus whilst at work, um, you know, there'd probably be a, a more causal link to the wedding than there would be at the workplace, given that they may be the only one that's tested positive. Absolutely. Um, the things that we've seen work so far, so out of those claims that we've seen that have been accepted, I, I have been doing a bit of follow-up because it has become a, a peak interest of ours, especially in sure fact and of myself, is communication being the key. Um, the number one action um, that has worked with the employers that have introduced new policies and um, vaccination programs is that communication piece. So when we've gathered the information in the, uh, in the investigations, you can see there's a clear line of communication and a vast amount of it, not so much that's overwhelming, but enough that it's, you know, the person actually knows what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. Um, that sort of leads into the second part of there being strong policies. So obviously with a new rollout and new um, of, of any policy, it needs to be have a strong backing to it. Um, it's not vague. It actually explains and outlines all the uh, different circumstances that may arise from there. And then obviously it's promoting health and safety in, in the workplace. So um, most of us in an office, you'll see that, you know, in different rooms, there's number limits. Um, you've got your social distancing rules, um, use of face masks, hand sanitizer and all those. So just making sure even when we're going in there and, and having those discussions with uh, the workplace and talking to the employer when you outline exactly those protocols that you have in there we're noting those down in those witness statements as well and, and making it form part of our reports um, you know it, we'll say that the employer is very um, much on the forefront of promoting health and safety they have mm -hmm. sanitizer in every room they've made sure that they've have um, antibacterial wipes um, you know if they've got that information there we'll put it into those reports and We've seen that work because there's that conscious level of, um, of safety within the organisation. Um, again, Jim, I'm not sure if you want to interject in here if there's anything more that you've seen have worked when you've, uh, when you've had matters come through as well. Um, no, but I'm just, I'm just looking here at what Safe Work New South Wales and the New South Wales government generally uh, tells the employers they have to do. And quite simply, and I'll read it because it's not long, businesses are required to keep their premises safe and minimise the risk of infection and transmission of COVID-19 in the workplace. Employers should continually assess the health and safety risks to their employees in their particular industry, given the changing risk profile. Uh, probably not the 19 emails in six weeks, but um, just uh, an update every maybe few months or something. Uh, if necessary. But this is the good one. Uh, you can direct your employees to get vaccinated where mandatory vaccination is included in a public health order or it would be lawful and reasonable to do so for work, work health and safety reasons. So after you've had your um, safety risk assessment expert report, that will tell you whether in the business that you have, and the setup that you have with your employees, whether you can actually require them to be vaccinated because all of the other precautions are not enough. Mm. Sorry, I, that wasn't straight on that point, but I just thought I'd get this. No, it <laughs> feeds well. It's very, uh, very well. <laughs> So, so we're coming to the end of the, the webinar now and we're nearly up to a full hour. So I'll, I'll quickly go through this um, and then we have the frequently asked questions that we'll try to get through as well. So the reality is, and, and sort of the theme through the slide is that at the end of the day, it comes down to that early intervention, um, your policies and procedures, the, the informative instruction and training that you provide your staff. Uh, this, then the strategic approach if you do have claims arise and how we, you know, understanding, you know, the, the way, the, the possible outcomes and then setting up 
I guess, uh, 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 um, an outcome through collaboration with your provider partners to actually then get the outcomes you want to you be able to see. You know, the, 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 the life cycle of the claim, the, the intent of the legislation, as we said before, hasn't changed. But the controls you have really is then determines, I guess, the liability outcome at the end of the day. And the onus always comes down to, or the, the weight of the onus, should I say, always comes down to the employer and pr improving that they have these clear policies and procedures in place. I think there was a lot of detail there that um, hopefully if you're if you're not if you're not doing or haven't take or haven't considered before you probably should start considering and I think I would also add that you know when it comes down to it um, you know we don't want to enter into a false sense of security you know Victoria and New South Wales is seem to be at their peak Queensland to a degree but the other states are starting to follow this trend now as well so if you are a national provider you know we need to continue to maintain these practices because at the end of the day someone can get COVID and lodge a claim and it will always come down to these processes uh, that will help establish um, a successful, I guess, liability determination um, at the end of the day. You know, we've had a good case study where we were able to actually, it was a physical injury, but uh, the, the individual, um, you know, I guess was presenting barriers about going back to work. And one of the factors they used was that they had fear, fear avoidance behaviors around COVID and then contracting COVID, et cetera. And this is in a particular industry where they needed to be vaccinated and they weren't vaccinated as well. Ultimately, we were able to actually get the wages to be uh, declined because they, weren't, they didn't comply with the return to work plan. But that was because we had the, not only the employer, but we worked in collaboration with the employer and the, the providers that were part of this claim, um, had the right policies, procedures, did the correct, correct compliance management you know, through the insurer, the communication pieces, documentation, which then set up the insurer to make an informed decision, actually execute um, you know, the piece of legislation which allowed them to, uh, to make that decision. So ultimately, there can be good, good outcomes in that regard, but, you know, there's a lot of work to make sure we set ourselves up appropriately. Now, just for the final piece and frequently asked questions, and I'll just sort of race through them. You know, one of them is li liability impact. I'll, I'll take this part off your, off your oh, hand, yeah. Sharon. You've had, a, you've, no had, you've had a good one today. Take a breath. Um, and also, just before I start, I'm just typing up the response here to Kusha. Your, your question was, what types of quantums are we looking at? For these COVID claims, Kusha, that ultimately depends on which state that, that the claim has been incurred in. Uh, liability impact, great segue to, to, to discuss this. Uh, obviously, liability would, would depend on, on the connection between, between uh, work and the virus. If, if there is, if there is a, a connection, then the claim will be accepted. Depending on what type of claim will depend on, on your quantum that you've asked for. Mental health claims, as we know, are extremely co costly and in Victoria, where, where I'm based, um, the, the statistical estimate of future loss can go as far as $1 million, which is just getting higher and higher each year. New South Wales, on the other hand, have exempt COVID claims from premium impact, so there actually won't be a quantum um, within, within those states. It, your average COVID uh, sickness, I, I guess, um, costs probably would not be exorbitant, we're looking at a few weeks of quarantine time and, and some minor ongoing medical assistance. I think where it gets quite costly is for those mental health type claims, their fear of, of losing their, their job, losing their job and, and the, the, the duties being removed in the incorrect way, which is something that we do see a lot happening in Victoria, New South Wales. So those mental health claims will certainly attract a, quite, a, quite, a, quite a higher cost to your business. Um, and just back to the premium impact as well, you know, great, great heads up from, from Jim and the retail sector is expected to have premium increases apply across the board. It's interesting, Sharon, because although they're, they're making the, the costs and the, the exempt from premium impact, mm -hmm. they're obviously got a plan to increase the rates to the sectors that have been hardest hit, mm -hmm. which sector would be uh, retail, transport, logistics, and a lot of those other areas, it would be uh, all the gazetted rates will be released in in March, April this year. So it, it'll be interesting to see what we're looking at for the next twelve months. I would have thought I would have thought, Jules, that the majority of claims leave out the site component because mm. the COVID situation and the loneliness mm. is often thrown in with other problems that are occurring mm. with that worker's performance of their duties. Mm. Leaving that aside, I would have thought the people that just come down with the COVID type flu, most of them, you, you would be talking about a couple of weeks and some medical expenses. Yes. And what. 
quite minor medical expenses, and the, the, the state government has has released a a um, a support plan to 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 for for immediate response for those in situations, particularly with the vaccine. So medical but expenses worst, aren't through the roof. But the, yeah, worst, no. the worst case scenario is the dental guy in New York. Yes. Mm. That's yes. worst case scenario. Nine hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. you're right. And I would actually highlight that you know where we've seen just a, a straight up. I, I've been, I've contracted COVID. I need to isolate. You know, for two weeks. I've had you know medical. Those have been really straightforward claims. They've been open and shut. They've moved on. There's been a very common sense approach to it. It's where we have claims where that you know COVID related where there's layered with psychosocial factors. So you know part of the outcomes here when we're dealing with these sort of claims and identifying you know claims which are going to be high risk is what mm -hmm. are the psychosocial factors uh, because often those become the, the influencing factors when we're dealing with these claims in the long term scenario. Okay. There's also the process of um, a worker not being vaccinated and and not being able to return to work following the mandate. And a lot of employers have been removing suitable duties or terminating employment, which immediately results in the injured worker having full-time compensation payable without a job. And that results in very high costs for the claim. Honan have been working through these aspects with our clients very closely because it has got potential to, to, to be quite expensive and ultimately premium impacting. Mm -hmm. uh, just to the next line there on reporting obligations, the landscape's changed a lot in the last two years. WorkSafe in Victoria asked us to report every, every positive COVID case in the workplace and they were assisting with, the, with, the, um, with DHHS at the time. That has since moved on. Uh, there's too much volume for them to need to know uh, about all the individuals. However, in WA, Jim, are you aware if WA still has the requirement to notify? I don't, mate. No, sorry. No, that's okay. Too far away. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. country at the moment. Yeah, yeah we can provide some, some well, figures like, on that. Like one of our um, attendees said, this all seem it's all very surreal over here. We don't really relate to what you're talking about. Mm, yeah. Well, yeah. I've seen... I've seen uh, 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 Paul, Paul has mentioned that they're just waiting for the wave to hit WA. In, yeah, it's a bit through there. Uh, uh, so our ongoing management, just talking to that. Um, we discussed earlier implementing a COVID safe plan to prevent potential exposure, either at the workplace or working from home. Working from home is obviously quite a quite an interesting situation to to navigate. And those formal processes and procedures, uh, ongoing supervision and communication from management is probably the best way to, to, to mitigate yeah. that risk while working at home. As a final, I guess, sum up and maybe a bit of a spanner and more of a tricky question, and, and Jim, I'll direct this to you, working from home um, and, and, or even the sure effect, um Crew, have we actually seen COVID cases arising from working from home where there's been a family exposure and they are isolating um, or any sort of um, insight you can give in that space? Because that's really going to be probably the one area where it's going to be hard to really differentiate. You know, certainly if you've always been working from home and have been for a long time and all of a sudden a family member, you know, presents with a, with a case. Personally, personally, I haven't seen anyone try that one on. Yeah. I think they'd be very hard pressed if they've been working from home for months to try and make it work related in some way. Mm -hmm. Unless, you know, one thing that immediately springs to mind is, oh, someone came from work to deliver some stuff to my house and, you know, a few days later I got it. They could try something like that on. But mm -hmm. um, they really they really have to show that uh, that causation, that it's more likely than not after like we said, there's a, a, a detailed factual investigation. So we get the timeline uh, and we try and work out whether they could link it to work in some way, either attending or some other interaction at a work yeah. function or whatever. Yeah, yeah we, we yeah, just yeah. started, uh, well, we investigated one not long ago. It wasn't a pure work from home, someone that works in a hybrid situation. Uh, they put in a claim saying they contracted COVID-19 in the workplace. As part of our investigation, we obviously investigated the, the timeline of events um, and the timeline shows that um, it wasn't just him that contracted COVID, it was his whole 
family um, and the only, ca only causal link that we could find in there was that their daughter attended a Girl Scout camp and 40 children contracted COVID there, whereas no one in the workplace, no one else in the workplace had contracted COVID-19. So um, that's the sort of information that we're obtaining when we're doing those investigations. And there, there has been not many, but um, a handful of claims where they've been working from home in a hybrid role. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, guys, that about sums up our time. We're a little bit over, but um, I think this was a, you know, um, very good content and um, thank you for all of our the people who have joined. Um, we hope this was insightful. We hope this was informative. Um, I guess one of the key takeaways is around your policies and procedures, your communication piece, but really the collaboration with your provider partners. They are really the people on the ground who are, are bringing this together. And, and I guess someone who knows your business, understands who you are, are going to really help build out this, these key insights and, and help make an informed decision when it